Now we're going to talk about structural heart disease focusing on the valves. There are two AV valves, the mitral and the tricuspid, and two semilunar valves, the aortic and the pulmonic, and they control the blood flow through the heart. Valvular heart disease is defined by the valves affected and the type of dysfunction, stenosis function, stenosis or regurgitation. The amount of stenosis, or the constricting or narrowing, is seen in the pressure differences. The higher the differences, the greater the stenosis. When regurgitation occurs, referred as incompetence or insufficiency, there is incomplete closure of the valve. This results in the backflow of blood, congealer disorders in children and adolescents. Aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation often occur in older adults who have some form of heart disease. Other causes of valve disease in adults are related to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome and the use of some anti-Parkinson's drugs. The pressure on either side of an open valve is normally equal. However in, a st however, in a stenotic valve, the valve opening is smaller. The forward flow of blood is impaired. This creates a difference in pressure on the two sides of the open valve. The most common cause of mitral stenosis is rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic mitral stenosis is widespread in developing countries. Less common causes are congenital mitral stenosis, are congenital mitral stenosis rheumatoid arthritis, radiation exposure, and systemic lupus erythematosus. Rheumatic infective endocarditis causes scarring of the valve leaflets and the chordae tendinae. Contractures and adhesions develop between the commissures. The stenotic mitral valve takes on a fish mouth shape. Valve takes on a fish mouth shape because of the thickening and shortening of the mitral valve structures. Severe mitral annular calcification is another cause in the aging population. These deformities block the blood flow and create a pressure difference between the left atrium and the left ventricle during diastole. As a result, left arterial higher pulmonary vascular pressure. The overloaded left atrium places the patient at risk for atrial fibrillation. In chronic mitral stenosis, pressure overload occurs in the left atrium, the pulmonary bed, and the right ventricle. The main symptom of mitral stenosis is exertional dyspnea caused by reduced lung compliance and a low-pitched diastolic murmur that's best heard at the apex with a stethoscope. Less often, patients may have hoarseness from atrial enlargement pressing on the laryngeal nerve, hemoptysis from pulmonary hypertension, and chest pain from decreased cardiac output and coronary perfusion. Emboli can form in the left atrium from atrial fibrillation and perfusion. Emboli can form in the left atrium from atrial fibrillation and cause a stroke. Fatigue and palpitations from atrial fibrillation may occur. Mitral valve function depends on intact mitral leaflets, mitral annulus, chordae tendinae, pulmonary muscles, left atrium, and left ventrum cause regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation may result from problems with leaflets or from the surrounding structures. In primary, also called degenerative mitral regurgitation, a problem with the leaflets causes the regurgitation. In secondary, also called functional mitral regurgitation, myo myocardial disease causes the regurgitation. Most cases of mitral regurgitation are caused by MI, chronic rheumatic heart disease, mitral valve prolapse, ischemic papillary muscle dysfunction, and infective endocarditis. Myocardial infarct with left ventricular failure increases the risk for the chordae tendinae and acute mitral regurgitation. When we talk about the manifestations of mitral regurgitation, they're divided into the acute and the chronic. In the acute, we see it's generally poorly tolerated. There's a new systolic murmur with pulmonary edema. Cardiogenic shock develops rapidly. We see more weakness, fatigue, exertional dyspnea, palpitations, S3, a gallop, or holosystolic murmur. Now we're going to talk briefly about mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse is an abnormality of the mitral valve leaflets and the papillary muscles or the chordae that allows the leaflets to prolapse or buckle back into the left atrium during systole. Mitral valve prolapse affects 2% to 3% of the general population. The use of the term prolapse can be misleading because it's used even when the valve is working normally. Mitral valve prolapse is usually benign, but serious complications can occur, including mitral regurg, effective endocarditis, sudden cardiac death, heart failure, and cerebral ischemia. Although the cause of mitral valve prolapse is unknown, there is an increased familial incident. 
the genetic inheritance is often autosomal dominant. Mitral valve prolapse in this group results from a connective tomal dominant. Mitral valve prolapse in this group results from a connective tissue defect affecting only the valve, or is part of Marfan syndrome or other hereditary conditions that affect collagen structure. In this picture, the arrow points to the prolapsed mitral valve. Mitral valve prolapse has a broad range of severity. Entire lives, about 10% of those with mitral valve prolapse become symptomatic. A characteristic of mitral valve prolapse is a regurgitation murmur that is louder during systole. Mitral valve prolapse does not alter S1 or S2 heart sounds. Severe mitral valve regurgitation is an uncommon but serious complication of mitral valve prolapse. They are used to confirm mitral valve prolapse. Dysrhythmias such as premature ventricular contractions, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, and ventricular tachycardia may cause palpitations, lightheadedness, and syncope. Infective endocarditis may occur in patients with mitral regurg associated with mitral valve prolapse. Some patients with mitral regurg associated with mitral valve prolapse. Some patients may have chest pain. The cause of the chest pain may be the result of abnormal tension on the papillary muscles. Chest pain episodes tend to occur in clusters, especially during periods of emotional stress. Dyspnea, palpitations, and syncope sometimes accompany the chest pain antianginal treatments like nitrates. Beta blockers may control palpitations and chest pain. Encourage patients to stay hydrated, exercise regularly, and to avoid caffeine. Most patients with mitral valve prolapse have a benign manageable course. For those that do develop symptomatic mitral regurgitation, no current therapy, no current therapy delays the need for valve surgery. A teaching plan for the patients with mitral valve prolapse is outlined in Table 3611 in your textbook. Congenital aortic stenosis is generally found in childhood, adolescence, or young adulthood. In older adults, aortic stenosis is a result of rheumatic fever or degeneration. Aortic stenosis is the most frequent degenerative valve disorder affecting 3% of the people over 65 years of age. In rheumatic valve disease, fusion and calcifications cause the valve leaflets to stiffen and retract, resulting in stenosis. Aortic stenosis due to rheumatic disease accompanies mitral valve disease. Isolated aortic stenosis, Isolated aortic stenosis is usually non-rheumatic. Clinical manifestations of aortic stenosis develop when the valve orifice becomes about a third of its normal size. They include the classic triad of angina, syncope, and exertional dyspnea reflecting left ventricular failure. Auscultation often reveals a normal or soft S1, a decreased or absent S2, and a crescendo-decrescendo systolic murmur with radiation to the carotids. Some people may be asymptomatic. The prognosis is poor for patients with symptoms and those whose valve obstruction is not fixed. Nitroglycerin is used cautiously to treat angina, sense the blood pressure, and worsen the chest pain. Aortic regurgitation may be the result of primary disease of the aortic valve leaflets, the aortic root, or both. Trauma, infective endocarditis, or aortic dissection can cause acute aortic regurgitation, which is a life-threatening emergency. Chronic aortic aortic regurgitation usually results from rheumatic heart disease, a congenital bicuspid aortic valve, syphilis, a connective tissue problem, or a post-surgical cause. Aortic regurgitation causes retrograde or backward blood flow from the ascending aorta into the left ventricle during diastole. This results during diastole. This results in volume overload. The left ventricle initially compensates for chronic aortic regurgitation by dilation and hypertrophy. Myocardial contractility eventually declines and the blood volume in the left atrium and the pulmonary bed increases. This leads to pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure. Have sudden signs of cardiovascular collapse. The patient develops sudden dyspnea, chest pain, and hypotension indicating left ventricular failure and cardiogenic shock. That's a life-threatening emergency. Patients with chronic severe aortic regurgitation develop a water hammer pulse. Strong, quick, beat that collapses immediately, beat that collapses immediately. Heart sounds may include a softer absent S1, S3, or S4, and a soft high-pitched diastolic murmur. The patient with chronic aortic regurgitation generally is asymptomatic for years. Exertional dyspnea, orthopnea, or proximal nocturnal dyspnea develop, dyspnea develop only after considerable heart dysfunction has occurred. Angina is less common with aortic regurgitation than with aortic stenosis.
Tricuspid regurgitation, or TR, can be primary or secondary. Primary TR is less common and is typically due to infective endocarditis. Secondary TR can, PR can be caused by right ventricular dilation from pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonae, or a pulmonary outflow tract obstruction. The patient doesn't show jugular vein distension, enlarged liver, and pulmonary edema until the regurgitation is severe. Diagnosis is made by history and physical as well as echocardiogram, the regurgitation. Tricuspid stenosis is almost always caused by rheumatic fever. Signs and symptoms include fluttering discomfort in the neck, fatigue, and possible right upper quadrant pain. Pulmonary regurgitation is often asymptomatic. A crescendo, decrescendo murmur is present. Potential causes include, potential causes include pulmonary hypertension, surgical repair of tetralogy of Fallot, or congenital valve disease. It can cause right ventricular dilation. Pulmonary stenosis is almost always a congenital part of tetralogy of Fallot. It results in right ventricular hypertension and hypertrophy. It's, lar it's largely asymptomatic. When symptoms develop, they're similar to those of aortic stenosis, syncope, dyspnea, and angina. Symptoms typically do not present until adulthood. Diagnosis of valvular heart disease includes information from history and physical examination and a variety of tests. There's a table third information. An echocardiogram shows valve structure, function, and heart chamber size. Transesophageal echocardiography and Doppler color flow imaging help diagnose and monitor valvular disease progression. Real-time 3D echocardiography can help assess mitral valve and congenital heart disease. Overall treatment focuses on preventing exacerbations of heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, thromboembolism, and recurrent rheumatic fever and infective endocarditis. Heart failure is treated with vasodilators, positive ionotropes, beta blockers, diuretics, and a low sodium diet. Sodium diet. Arterial dysrhythmias are common, and they're treated with calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, antidysrhythmic drugs, or electrical conversion. Anticoagulant therapy is used in patients with atrial fibrillation to prevent systemic or pulmonary emboli. An alternative treatment for some patients with valvular dysplasty, referred to as a PTBV. During a PTBV, the fused commissures are split open. Balloon valvuloplasty treats mitral, tricuspid, pulmonic, and aortic stenosis. The PTBV procedure is done in the heart catheterization laboratory. It involves threading a procedure is done in the heart catheterization laboratory. It involves threading a balloon-tipped catheter from the femoral artery or vein to the stenotic valve. The balloon is inflated to separate the valve leaflets. A single or double balloon technique may be used. Using a single balloon technique with an hourglass shape allows sequential inflation. It is popular because it's easy and has good results with few complications. Like PTBV, the Sapien transcatheter heart valve, or the THV, is used for select patients with aortic stenosis. The THV is inserted through the femoral artery and moved to the heart. It's released and expanded with a balloon in the location of the aortic valve. This procedure is limited to patients who are eligible for surgery, but who are at high risk for surgical complications, such as those with multiple comorbidities. The decision for valve repair or replacement depends on the patient's symptoms using the New York Heart Association Classification System for Functional Disability. That's Table 30 Functional Disability. That's Table 34.3 in your textbook. The procedure used depends on three things. First, the valves involved. Second, the pathology and severity of the disease. And third, the patient's condition. Valve repair is preferred over replacement when clinically appropriate. Valve repair has a lower operative mortality by cuspid valve disease. Although repair avoids the risk of replacement, it may not restore total valve function. Open surgical valvuloplasty involves repair of the valve by suturing the torn leaflets, the chordae tendinae, or papillary muscles. It is primarily used to treat mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. Minimally involves a mini sternotomy or a peristernal approach. It may involve robotic or thoroscopic surgical systems. Advantages include shorter lengths of stay, fewer blood transfusions, less pain, and lower risk for sternal infections and post-operative atrial fibrillation. For patients with mitral or post-operative atrial fibrillation. For patients with mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, future valve repair or reconstruction using 
Annuloplasty is an option. Annuloplasty involves reconstruction of the annulus with or without the aid of prosthetic rings. Valve replacement may be needed for mitral aortic valves are available. Desirable valves are non-thrombogenic, are durable, and create minimal stenosis. Valves are either mechanical or biological. Biological valves are tissue valves. Mechanical valves are made from artificial materials. They consist of combinations of metal alloys, pyrolytic carbons of metal alloys, pyrolytic carbon, and dacron. Biological valves are made from bovine, porcine, and human cadaver heart tissue. They usually contain some human-made materials. A decellularizing process removes the cadaver cells from the valve to lower the risk of tissue rejection. Biologic valves are asymmetric in size. They produce a more natural pattern of blood flow compared with mechanical valves. Mechanical valves are more durable and last longer than biological valves. However, they have an increased risk for thromboembolism. Patients need long-term anticoagulation therapy, which increases the risk of bleeding. The risk of bleeding. Anticoagulation therapy is not needed for biological valves because of their low thrombogenicity. However, they are less durable and tend to cause early calcification, tissue degeneration, and stiffening of the leaflets. Both valve types are subject to leaking and risk for infective endocarditis. This picture shows one is biological. A is a Star Edwards caged ball valve. B is a St. Jude's bileaflet valve. C is a Carpentary Edwards porcine valve. And D is a core value transcatheter aortic valve. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or a TAVR, is an option for patient with an option for patient with Transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, is an option for patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are at an intermediate risk or higher for surgical aortic valve replacement, or SAVR. Symptomatic aortic stenosis has a poor prognosis if left untreated. The procedure is, the procedure is ideally done using a transfemoral approach. The evaluation for TAVR includes echocardiogram, coronary CT angiogram, heart catheterization, and pulmonary function tests. Imaging can determine valve size and the plan for the procedure. Currently, there are two TAVR valves in the United States. The Edward Sapien III valve is made of a bovine pericardial tissue. It is a balloon expandable valve. The core valve, transcatheter aortic valve, is a self-expanding valve made from porcine pericardial tissue. This picture shows a placed Edwards Sapien III transcatheter heart valve. Edwards Sapien III transcatheter heart valve. Nursing assessment consists of both subjective and objective data as shown in the slide. There's a table in your textbook, 3613, that gives more details about what should be included in the assessment. Nursing diagnoses would talk about impaired cardiac output, which would lead to impaired tissue balances. Goals should look to achieving normal heart function, improving activity tolerance, and understanding the disease and the health maintenance measures. Health promotion activities that encourage early treatment of streptococcal infections and provide prophylactic antibiotics for patients with a history of rheumatic fever are critical to preventing acquired valve disease. The patient at risk for infective endocarditis and any patient with certain heart conditions must receive prophylactic antibiotics. Teach the patient with a history of rheumatic fever, infective endocarditis, or congenital heart disease the symptoms of valvular heart disease to report. In acute and ambulatory care, we need to know report. In acute and ambulatory care, we need to know the patient with progressive valvular heart disease may need outpatient care or hospitalization to manage heart failure, infective endocarditis, embolitic disease, or dysrhythmias. Heart failure is the most common reason for ongoing medical care. Design activities can increase cardiac tolerance, but activities that cause fatigue and dyspnea should be limited. Tell the patient to avoid strenuous physical exercise because damaged valves may not handle the increased cardiac output demand. Develop your patient's care plan to emphasize conserving energy, setting priorities, and taking planned rest periods. Discourage priorities and taking planned rest periods. Discourage tobacco use. Consider a referral to a vocational counselor for a patient who has a physically or emotionally demanding job. Perform ongoing cardiac assessments to monitor for effectiveness of drugs. Teach the actions and side effects of drugs to increase adherence. 
the patient must and the importance of prophylactic antibiotic therapy to prevent infective endocarditis. When valvular heart disease can no longer be managed medically, surgery is needed. The pre- and post-op care of this patient is very similar to care of patients having open heart surgery that we discussed in Chapter 33. The patient on anticoagulants or surgery for valve replacement must have an international normalized ratio or an INR checked regularly to determine proper dosage and adequacy of therapy. INR ratios of 2.5 to 3.5 are therapeutic for patients with mechanical valves. A teaching guide related to anticoagulation therapy is found in Table 37.1. Teach the patient to follow up with the health care provider regularly and when to seek urgent medical care. Tell the patient to notify the health care provider of any signs of infection, heart failure, or bleeding, or any planned invasive or dental work. And lastly, encourage the patient to wear a medic alert device or a bracelet and to carry the manufacturer's valve, in valve information card. We want to evaluate and make sure we've met our expected patient outcomes of maintaining adequate tissue and organ perfusion, achieving fluid and electrolyte balance, achieving optimal level of activity, and that the patient can describe the disease process